Hi everyone, this lesson is on the signs and symptoms of a vitamin B1 or thiamine deficiency. So in this lesson, we're going to talk about what thiamine is. We're also gonna talk about where we get it, some of the risk factors for having a thiamine deficiency. And then we're gonna talk about the signs and symptoms of thiamine deficiency and why they occur. So vitamin B1 or thiamine is a water soluble vitamin. It is required for energy metabolism. And more specifically, it's required for glucose metabolism. Now, the problem with vitamin B1 or thiamine is that it has a very short term storage. And because of that, we have to continually get vitamin B1 from our diet. Now, almost all foods have some thiamine in them, but some foods have higher levels of thiamine. And these include chicken, pork, soybeans, nuts, brown rice, peas, whole grains, and other fortified grains. Now, some of the causes of a vitamin B1 or thiamine deficiency include decreased dietary intake. So this makes sense. We're not getting enough in our diet this can cause a thiamine deficiency. Essentially, this is going to occur in patients who eat very little. We can also see it in conditions where there is a decreased absorption of vitamins in general, and this can include gastrointestinal conditions like celiac disease. We can also see it occurring in patients who utilize too much vitamin B1 or thiamine, and this can be in the case of pregnancy. And then we can also see it in cases where there is a condition where a patient is losing vitamin B1, for instance, in urinary excretion, which can occur in patients who abuse alcohol. If you want more information and more details on the causes of vitamin B1 deficiency, please check out my full lesson on this topic. So if there is a vitamin B1 or thiamine deficiency, it may lead to the following conditions. It may lead to Wernicke-Korsakoff syndrome, which is more likely to occur in patients who abuse alcohol or it can lead to a condition known as beriberi, and there's actually two conditions, dry and wet beriberi. The topic of this lesson is the signs and symptoms of a vitamin B1 deficiency, which can occur within four weeks of a thiamine deficiency. So it can occur quite rapidly if a patient doesn't replenish vitamin B1 levels. Now let's talk about those signs and symptoms. So we're gonna first talk about the earliest symptoms of a vitamin B1 deficiency. These include anorexia, so decreased appetite, or reduced or loss of appetite. And this can lead to weight loss. So this again is one of the earliest symptoms of a vitamin B1 deficiency. We can also see irritability occurring as well. Irritability and anxiety can occur as early symptoms of a vitamin B1 deficiency. And then we can see short-term memory issues occurring as well. And these include reduced working memory. So the ability to hold on to information temporarily in your working memory may be reduced if you have a vitamin B1 deficiency. We can also see fatigue and feeling tired as symptoms of a vitamin B1 deficiency early on in the deficiency process. Abdominal pain can also occur as well. Oftentimes it's going to be described as a vague discomfort. And then vertigo can also occur as well. Vertigo is feeling like the room is spinning. And then along with this vertigo, there can be some double vision that may occur. Now, if the vitamin B1 deficiency is prolonged, it can lead to some of those medical conditions we talked about before, one of them being dry berry berry. So we're going to first talk about dry berry berry. Dry berry berry is going to lead to issues with the nervous system. It's going to lead to sensory issues. So some of the sensory issues that can occur in dry berry berry include peripheral neuropathy, neuro meaning nerve and pathy meaning disease. So it's the disease of nerves in the periphery. More specifically, it's going to be paresthesias, which are numbness and tingling sensations in, in the periphery, meaning in the extremities, like your hands and your feet. And it's going to be symmetric. So it's going to be on both sides of the body. Symmetric peripheral neuropathy is going to be found in dry beriberi. And then this numbness and tingling sensation is going to be worse at night. Dry beriberi can also lead to muscle symptoms as well. These include leg cramping. Arms may be affected as well, especially later on as dry berry berry progresses. And again, these symptoms can also be often worse at night. And then eventually the muscles can become weakened and atrophied. And then there can be decreased reflexes as well in dry berry berry. And when a clinician does a physical examination, it may reveal hyporeflexia. So if they were to check the patellar reflex, tap using a reflex hammer, the reflex is going to be blunted. It's going to be hyporeflexic. Now let's talk about wet beriberi, the other beriberi condition. This is going to affect the cardiovascular system. It's going to affect the heart, and it's going to lead to heart failure. This is a high output congestive heart failure. 
and it's caused by peripheral vasodilation. The decreased thymine levels lead to peripheral vasodilation. So the blood vessels in your periphery or in your extremities are going to be dilated, and this is going to lead to decreased blood pressure, and this is going to require your heart to pump more and increase the cardiac output. So this can lead to high output congestive heart failure, and it can lead to dilated cardiomyopathy where the heart muscles become weak and floppy. And some of the signs and symptoms of heart failure include chest pain, this is going to be due to demand ischemia. It's going to lead to shortness of breath, especially shortness of breath on exertion. And it may lead to dyspnea or shortness of breath at night when lying down, which is called orthopnea. And then some of the other clinical features include tachycardia or an increased heart rate. And then along with this heart failure is peripheral swelling. So the peripheral swelling is due to the vasodilation itself, but also due to eventual congestive heart failure. So this peripheral swelling or peripheral edema is going to be caused by leakage of fluids into the interstitial space, and it's going to lead to the legs and possibly the arms being swollen or edematous. When checked, the extremities are warm to touch because of that vasodilation. And then I mentioned this with the heart failure, but the fluid may also back up into the lungs causing pleural effusion that's going to lead to some of those signs and symptoms I talked about before, the shortness of breath, especially the orthopnea as well. So those are the two beriberi conditions. Now let's talk about Wernicke's encephalopathy. Wernicke's encephalopathy and Korsakoff syndrome typically occur in patients who abuse alcohol. So in Wernicke's encephalopathy, we're going to see confusion. So confusion is going to be found in Wernicke's encephalopathy. It's actually quite common. We're also going to see ataxia. So ataxia is an inability or reduction or loss of full control of bodily movements. And we're also going to see eye issues in Wernicke's encephalopathy, and this includes nystagmus. Oftentimes, a way to remember the symptoms of Wernicke's encephalopathy is by remembering the mnemonic CAN, C for confusion, A for ataxia, and N for nystagmus. So nystagmus, the best way to learn about nystagmus is to actually see a video of what nystagmus is. But briefly, if you were to get the patient to follow one of your fingers without moving their head, just follow with their eyes. If you get them to follow one way, and then you get them to move and follow your fingers the other way, what will happen is their eyes may try to beat back toward the previous side. That is nystagmus. And if you want more information on this, please check out a video on what nystagmus looks like. And then some other eye issues that can occur in Wernicke's encephalopathy include ophthalmoplegia and ophthalmoparesis. And this is essentially a paralysis of the eye or eyes. So we can also see this occurring in Wernicke's encephalopathy as well. Now, Wernicke's encephalopathy is a reversible neurological condition. But if a patient continues to have Wernicke's encephalopathy and they continue to have a vitamin B1 or thymine deficiency, it can ultimately lead to Korsakoff syndrome. Korsakoff syndrome is where there are parts of the brain that become damaged, and some of these include the mammillary bodies in the brain. And what will happen to these patients is the following. They will have confabulation. So confabulation is sort of a classic finding when learning about Korsakoff syndrome, but it's not always present. So it's commonly stated to be a feature of Korsakoff's, but it's not always present. But Again, it's important to recognize. Confabulation is where the patient confabulates. So they don't remember what might have happened to them in the past. They fill in those gaps in their memory with certain stories. And they don't necessarily think they're lying about it either. They actually believe those stories they are using to fill in their gaps in their memory. So this is confabulation. They'll kind of come up with things to fill the gaps in their memory to make a coherent story, even though it didn't happen to them. So this is confabulation. So again, they believe that the memory actually happened to them, and they're unaware that the memories are false. And then Korsakoff syndrome patients can also have long-term memory issues as well. These are anterior grade and retrograde amnesia. So anterior grade meaning that at the point where they are diagnosed with Korsakoff syndrome, future memories are going to be lost or not remembered. And then retrograde amnesia is the opposite. Past memories before they get Korsakoff syndrome are also affected. So they get both anterior grade and retrograde amnesia. And then this can ultimately lead to dementia later on in life. Korsakoff syndrome patients have a poor insight. They're not aware of their condition. So this poor insight fits in with this confabulation. They're unaware that their memories are false, for instance, that would be something showing that they have poor insight. And oftentimes, Korsakoff syndrome is irreversible. Some 
cases, perhaps it is reversible, but most are irreversible. So if you want to learn more about beriberi condition, Korsakoff syndrome, Wernicke's encephalopathy, or the causes of vitamin B1 deficiency, please check out my full lessons on those topics. And if you haven't already, please like and subscribe for more lessons like this one. Thanks so much for watching and hope to see you next time.